Hey there, Knicks fans. How you doing? It's your boy, Jonathan Macri, with you for another episode of the Knicks Film School podcast. Ding dong, the curse is dead. Um, I don't know. I don't know if it's something we did. I don't know if it's the fact that there was children at the event. Uh, I don't know if it was the fact that Jeremy graced us with his presence and then went to watch the game in person at, at MSG. But whatever it is, we are recording this episode coming off of a Knicks Film School watch party that saw a victory. Jeremy, I'm very happy about this development. I don't know about you. It's great. You know, I guess there was a curse. I didn't really think there was. Just felt like there were consistent bad luck games. That <laughs> what is that if not a curse? Right. Well, but in the sense of like we the, <laughs> the most important, curse. but the most important game that was won was the playoff game. So it's That's like true. that was right squarely in the middle of it. So it, to me, it was like, if you can you be cursed if you're still winning and the more important one is the victory? I didn't think so. So they won. Which they were always going to do. They were always going to beat the Nets because I just believed this game was going to be a win. And with the Sixers game, we hoped it would be a win. Certainly wasn't. Yeah. Thunder game last year should have been a win, of course. But we're back on track. So just need one more and then you got a winning streak. Uh, you sound like the manager in major league. Um, yeah, I, you know what it is. I had a bad feeling when I, I went, to, I dropped my, my, uh, wife, Dolores and our two children off at uh, T squared social. And then, uh, I, I <laughs> when I was walking back, my, I got a text from my wife saying, Izzy's already a disaster. Can you pick up M and M's at a bodega or something? Thinking that there's like you know going to be a bodega in the middle of Forty Second Street. So I was like, this is a bad sign um, that my youngest is already like not cooperating. And then when you throw in the Macal Bridges half court shot, and then the Cam Thomas third quarter buzzer beater, I'm like, man, maybe that's when I started to believe in in the wrong kind of magic. But like you said, this all's well that ends well, right? Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, so here we are. Um, recording this, uh, Sunday, uh, 7 55 PM. We had actually planned originally on starting this pod a little bit later because we wanted to have a, a full and complete picture playoff picture, um, that would be, uh, facing the Knicks after what was a, a very successful week, two in one week here in which the Knicks beat the Warriors, lost a, uh, a tight game, um, to the Nuggets. And then, uh, they, of course, um, beat the Nets in the game that we were just referencing. And we wanted to know where we, they would stand in the playoff race in light of that week um, with the Cavs playing the Heat tip off six o'clock on Sunday night. And uh, even though tip off to that game was at six o'clock, uh, the game ended at approximately like 645. I think it was when the Heat took their first 25 or 30 point lead. So as you were listening to this, the Knicks will be... Um, I tied in the loss column, right? With Cleveland uh, for third place in the East. So starting off with that, good news. Rejoice. I don't know. I mean, there's still, you know, three weeks left to go in the season, but that's good news, right? It's good news, especially considering the Cavs have a difficult uh, schedule afterwards. They're going West for a five game trip at some point. And that's not going to be easy for them, especially if they don't have Donovan Mitchell healthy. Yeah. Yeah, They're going to go to, they've, Two easy games, Charlotte home and home, and then the games uh, against Philadelphia, also missing their star. And then at Denver, Utah, Phoenix, both LA teams, and then home against the Grizzlies, the Pacers, and the Hornets. Yeah. So it's did like I, a. Did a I miss that we're doing the, seg- the playoff picture segment now? Do you want me to put up the thing on the screen? I, can sure. well, I went rogue. Sure. Sorry about that. Yeah, I, I made a thing. If you'd like to discuss the well, playoff picture like, now, yeah, but here I have I have my reasons. I wanted to start off with something positive, as opposed to the negative thing that we are that that, that you put at the top of of the rundown. Because I am a positive guy, Andrew. That's why. Yes. So by no one else's suggestion, let's let's ignore what I put at the top of the rundown. I the said I wanted thing. to cover it in the beginning, not leave yes. with it. I literally said next. Okay, now we're going behind the scenes. John had one request for the rundown today. I'd like to start with the OG injury. And I was like, sure. The first question will be, how concerned are you about OG Ananobi? And I, here we are talking about the playoff picture. Now, now, now you're making me check my, my tech. Did I say, did I say start with it? 
if if so, that that's then that, that's my bad. It might have uh, been top of the show. You did thumb up when I said, okay, the first question will be that. Which so is I, 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 I'm reading it somewhere near the top. Near and when the I top. said, and when I said we will start, you thumbed up. You can't put a thumb up enough. and then have me not think that means okay, you're good with this we, being first. We've we've devolved into semantics. This this is not what the people come to hear. <laughs> um <laughs> Talk about the playoff picture. <laughs> <laughs> the thing that's staring at me on the screen. So, yeah, here, here we are. Um, it, Jeremy, you just went through Cleveland's schedule. Uh, something that we will not be able to talk about definitively is the result of Milwaukee's game. Uh, they are in second place. They're playing against Oklahoma City uh, right now. And then they go on to uh, face the Lakers and then road trip Pels, uh, Hawks, Washington. I've been saying it. And look, maybe this people could throw this back in my face later. I'm not even paying attention to the Bucks anymore between the tiebreaker and between the lead that they have and between the fact that they're a, you know, very talented team who doesn't is not facing any major injuries. Giannis ducking uh, Celtics games notwithstanding, uh, I think they're they're safe to be, you know, two or three. So, the Knicks, we know what the Knicks story is. They have three more quote-unquote easy, winnable, whatever you want to say, games coming up and then the schedule gets dicier. Uh, starting with an OKC game at home and then on the road to Miami. The team that at this point, you know, and we don't have to spend a lot of time on it because it is what it is. It's kind of obvious at this point that I think, I don't know if they should be considered a bigger bigger threat than Cleveland to, to snatch the three seed. I kind of think of them that way. Is the Orlando Magic, um, who uh, notably owned the tiebreaker against the Knicks. And here are their next bunch of games. The Warriors, the Clippers, who got shellacked in the fourth quarter at home to the uh, Sixers uh, just a little while earlier today. Uh, the Memphis Grizzlies, or the Memphis Hustle, as it were, and then the Portland Trailblazers. And then they go on the road to New Orleans, which is a team that they just beat in their own building uh, a few nights ago. And then after that, it, we have Indiana in sixth, and then Miami and Philly battling out for play in position. Um, I'm not going to go through Miami and Philly's schedule. I will say that Indy just because they do own the tiebreaker against the Knicks needs to continue to be paid attention to that said their next five games road uh, Lakers. That is that tonight, Andrew, the yeah, that's tonight. Okay. Uh, road Lakers. So that again, we won't have that result for you, unfortunately, but then road Clippers road bulls home Lakers, and then a home and home with uh, Brooklyn. We'll see if um, the latest uh, call for the, the nets to try harder. In, in basketball games uh, actually, you know, lands uh, somewhere where it is meaningful. So that's the playoff picture. Uh, I, I mean, I kind of said what I wanted to say, which is that I think Orlando is the team to to beat, quote unquote, right now. Uh, Jeremy, any additional thoughts other than that? No, I think it's fair. I there's a very funny scenario, which is that the Knicks and Cavs play each other in that first round with the four and the five. I mean, yeah. could in theory, based on how these teams are bunched up together, even be a three, six matchup just based on injuries it's and not, everything. It's not nuts. Can't rule it out, yeah. but oh, it's, I, I would push back against the bucks, like just writing them off as the second seed. Okay. Because there is, there is one game that the Knicks and the bucks are facing each other for the hope of course sure. would be that the Knicks and the bucks can play each other when the Knicks are fully healthy, which um, the last time that they met in the Knicks one, they were not, quite able to do of course it was a different team mm -hmm. if memory serves it was uh you know what christmas well, no, the, was the last the time la played or there was one before that it, one no after there that. was the, there was the back-to-back -back games christmas and then the game two two days before christmas so we have not faced the bucks with like this version of the team basically right so i'm intrigued to see what that looks like of course so but they're at this very moment of course we'll see what happens with the thunder game uh, three games ahead if it's two and a half by the end of the night you know if the knicks were able to win down the line, that Knicks Bucks game, then looking at one and a half, as you mentioned, the Bucks have the tiebreaker. So Knicks have an easier schedule ahead of them. The Bucks going a little bit of a, a road trip as well. Same number of the next five, or really, as we're looking, next five, they're home versus away, two at home as of this very moment, three away. Same with the Knicks. But, you know, Pelicans are a fantastic team this year. The Hawks, they're a bit of an enigma. When they have one point guard on the floor, the Wizards, I believe, have won two straight games, even though they are certainly in a Is race a to fact? the bottom. I think I, they have. I, I did not I, realize they'd won a second consecutive game, but I will take your word for it. I believe that, yes, they have won two in a row. So break, break up the Wizards. I, I'm with you in that 
Bucks should be the heavy favorite to be the second seed overall. I just wouldn't write them in pen quite yet. Okay. If it's, and it's going to be pen. Make sure it's an erasable pen, not a fountain pen. <laughs> That's fair. Um, look, at this point, as has been said by many people in many different ways, the most important thing, which is going to obviously transition to our next topic, is that the Knicks arrive to the playoffs with as close to a full bill of health uh, as possible. If the Knicks arrive at the playoffs healthy, they should be favored in any first round matchup that they face. I don't care if they're at home. I don't care if they're on the road. It does not matter. Um, You know, would it be nice if they had some time to develop, uh, not develop chemistry, but like kind of refine the chemistry that they already had? Um, Yes, but they should be favored. They should be picked to win any round one matchup. And like, yeah, I think... if you had your druthers, you'd like to be in the two or the three, sure. But list if it's the four, if it's the five, if it's the six, like you do what you gotta do. Um, and, and you go on from there. Okay. Uh the the less fun topic, the one that I, yes, me, I'm the problem, it's me, requested, Andrew, that we talk about at the top of the show is the injury situation. Which up until now, I, I really don't think I at any point in time have been concerned about. Um, and Andrew has a question here to start us off. When do you project that an OG and OB will return? And at which point do we start getting worried about his playoff status, if not already there? I I think that's the correct phrasing of the question. And I I can't tell at this point if like I'm not I'm not letting myself get worried about it because that's the rational, logical thing to do, or I'm not letting myself get worried about it because I don't want to let myself get worried about it. Because if I let myself get worried about it, that means there's a problem. And if you acknowledge the problem, that means it actually exists. Um, and and I, th- I think the tough part with all of this is, w- w- and I'm curious your take on this in particular, I took the reporting on the inj- on the surgery, specifically the surgery, as let's get the surgery done so it makes the problem go away. And so we don't have to continue to deal with this. Well, now he's going to miss the Pistons game. That's four straight games. It would appear to be, or appear that the problem has not gone away and that we are still dealing with it. The uncertainty lies in the fact that you don't get anything out of the Knicks. You can't trust anything the Knicks say. So is this the Knicks just exercising the umpteenth degree of caution? Or is this OJ Ananobi like, really not able to go by his own standards, which adds another layer of complication because like how hurt is he really? And I don't want to start questioning you guys toughness. I'm not going to do that, but it's just a really complicated situation. And like, ultimately my mind is still like, as long as this is not a long-term issue, I kind of am not going to get that worked up about it, which I think is where you're at, but I'm, I'm curious where your, where your head's at right now. I'm at about, DEFCON 3, if we had to put it right in the middle. Yep. If he does not return for the Thunder game, I'm going to be DEFCON 2. And if there's time from that, you know, I'll reassess. But I see it as the way it was, you know, build gets healthy, at least that I read into it, which maybe that's wrong, was he got the surgery, cleaned it up. Nothing that's serious in terms of the long term comes back, works through, you know, any rust, knocks it off, and then we're seeing the impact. And of course, we saw the defensive impact, and we saw, even when his shot wasn't falling quite as well, how the Knicks improved on that. And, uh, but now, you kind of can like, well, it's it's been a handful of games, and that management isn't quite what I would have thought. And again, maybe that thought was wrong. But, I, I and I, th- yes, there is a level of uh, cynicism that certainly comes with the Knicks, but I'll be candid. That applies to teams all across the league and all across sports. We just focus on the Knicks because that's our team, but there are plenty of teams that are doing the same exact thing with their players. And it's just simply not on our radar because we just wouldn't pay as much attention to it. But from the Knicks vantage point, it's absolutely apparent that we get, essentially what is told to us and that's what we're going off of Mm -hmm. and not a whole lot of the other things. And that's, it can be frustrating to not have the answers. It's always a challenge when you want to operate with a full deck and you're getting maybe like 
a dozen cards here. <laughs> so I I'm at the point now where I'm able to give it some patience. It's like with Randall, not to skip ahead, but also no. Well, that's the next here, topic. Yeah, it's like as of this moment, my understanding of this injury is there's a high likelihood that he could aggravate it and the Knicks are in a tough spot. So perhaps there is the rust factor, but is there a difference between now and him coming back in a couple of weeks? I don't know. Is there a difference in terms of like, let's say his health stays around the same, but is there a risk or a greater risk of him getting hurt? And then like in meaningless competition yeah. it's not meaningless but less meaningful well, no but, and then I, it and then yeah. it hurts the knicks down the line i don't know that's what i'm trying to figure out in terms of that operating like what i'm operating off of but i simply just don't know because all it takes i mean we've all seen bam out of bio screens for example it just takes one player going around randall on a dho to yeah. oops and suddenly the knicks are in a very precarious hold on jeremy spot. jeremy it almost sounds like you're implying, I, I can't even say these words out loud. It almost sounds like you're implying the Heat would target a formerly injured player to try to re injure something that they know is a soft spot. You would never do that, though. I know. No, no, that's why I said A, Bam. Like, you know, as an example, like, as uh, one like example a, of um, any number of I mean, dozens Hawkins of examples. Junior, right. Like, okay, like great. totally just hypothetical, cool. right? In general. Not, no, I would never say a specific no, player. We don't, that we, we, be, we're, we're not, we, we don't play dirty. No, uh, no, no, like, no, no, like the heat here. Um, l- but look, <laughs> not, not to go full, uh, not to go full deer hunter here, but like the Randall thing for me, it, I think, again, I'm maybe just my assumption is like a game of Russian roulette where they only like if you if you pick wrong, like that's it, the game is over. And but there's a possibility you're going to get. How, I mean, however many shots you can get. And it's just a matter of like, when do you want to take your first chance? And like, they've, so I, I don't know when I was going to say this, but I did want to say it at some point that if they win against the Pistons, famous last words, but let's, let's hope they win against the Pistons. If they win against the Pistons. They will have gone 500, I believe 11 and 11 in games without either of Ananobi or Randall. Uh, obviously three games above 500 or they're now two games above 500 in games without Randall. If you tossed in the three wins with Ananobi, like I, I, I keep going back to this idea that they bet on their own ability to survive. And the more evidence that they have gotten, especially with, again, not to get ahead of our next topic, do some pride with this, this McBride emergence. I think they keep feeling like, we're going to be okay. We're going to be okay. We're going to be okay. And now you have the Pistons, you have the Spurs, you have um, the Raptors who are like kind of a shell of themselves. And they're, I just, I feel like they're biding their time. That's my, again, assumption of how it is going with the Randall thing. The OG part of it concerns me more because we just, there's more of an, I don't know. I feel like there's more of an uncertainty there that, but that's, and then Mitch, it's just about like, we got a good update on Mitch. Now it's like, okay, well, what, is it conditioning? Like, I don't know what it is. Like, that's, do you have any thoughts on the Mitch thing? I don't know. Yeah. Is it going to be that he just comes back against the Thunder? Because why risk it? But then again, do you want his first game to be against such a, a significant yeah. opponent? Do you bring him back against the Spurs? Is that like having an inferior opponent would be certainly ideal? But then why wasn't it the Nets? It's not going to be. The Pistons potentially. I mean, I know OG was ruled out, he's, but no, he's but been. I Mitch, believe Mitch has been ruled out as well as 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 is Julius. Right. So that is the prevailing question of what are you waiting for? What exactly is the holdup? I would like to know. We won't know. It'll just be oh yeah, this player is returning from a uh, from an extended yeah. absence, and you know we'll just have to wait until then. Unfortunately, no other answers. <laughs> no, there are no other answers. Uh, before we move on to Deuce, let's shoot, like one more thing on the injury stuff. I, at this point, like I, I'm trying to think how I want to how I want to ask this is like I'm almost wondering: is there any world where we are going? We're we're going to go into the playoffs with like full confidence in where the Knicks are at. And I ask it because I, I kind of think not. Like, let's say the all three guys come back for the end of the regular season. Well, 
there's still going to be the risk that Randall re-injures himself and it could happen at any given point in time. With OG, maybe maybe that risk subsides, but like, okay, well, if you think that like Randall's going to go out at that point, how big of a sample size will there be for us to to think like, all right, we'll still be fine because we have this because we have so little evidence of the post OG trade team with OG, but without Randall. So it's like, I, I just feel like they're going to be walking a tightrope for the rest of the season. And it's like, you know, it is what it is. I, I That's really all there is to it. I agree. Yeah. It's going to be frustrating, but that's, so hopefully they come back and we don't have to worry as much about them launching into the playoffs with less time to get acclimated. <laughs> Yeah, and I, yeah, I, I'm I almost wonder at this point do would it be better if the last few games of the regular season don't even matter one way or the other, you know, to give like e- even additional time for rest? But we're we're getting out of ourselves. Okay, let's let's talk about Deuce McBride. Um, so Deuce McBride, I'm doing a whole uh, a newsletter on him for more. I'm kind of stepping into your territory by by writing a, a little bit about his contract and how. It is like slowly becoming, not slowly, it's quickly becoming one of the best value contracts in the league. And like the most interesting part of the deuce thing, because it is a thing now for me, is the continued evolution of what we think he is and what his role is on a good team. And specifically, this good team where. Jalen Brunson is the epicenter of everything that they do. And um, for the first time, really, since uh, I mean, for the first, like in the last few weeks, for the first time since they have been on the same roster together, the two of them have played significant minutes together. Obviously, they've played a ton of minutes together the last three games uh, when McBride has started in place of effectively OJ Ananobi. And man, it, Looks really good. It's a tiny sample size with the starting five, but I looked it up before uh, cleaning the glass. They're against it's 140 some odd possessions, uh, plus 24.5 uh, points per hundred. They're outscoring opponents by, which is, I mean, it's 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 awesome. Um, which ba- <laughs> makes me makes me think like if you have Brunson and you have a healthy Hardenstein, like does it matter who else you plug in? Like, you just plug in anyway, you know, and we'll talk about those guys. I'm sure a little bit later, but I don't know what, what, what about the McBride thing is maybe most exciting to you or most interesting to you, you know, given what we've seen recently. Uh, the Knicks chose right between him yeah. and Quentin Grimes, yeah. because there was a prevailing thought leading up to the deadline after you've just paid deuce and he's seeing some time and Mc and, Bride does uh, Grimes, excuse me, does not have the playing time that he certainly wants. That the Knicks couldn't just let both cook, especially because McBride is just not that lead guard, and that's totally fine because he's able to do a hell of a lot more. The only thing I can think of that really irked me about him in the last week was when he passed out of an open corner three to hit Josh Hart on the wing uh. for Hart to miss it. I'm like, I was, I was screaming. That's like, a good call in my seat. Like that's your shot. Like that, don't. Don't do don't yeah. do that. That's not Josh Hart's shot, but that's, yeah. it's fine because he made up for it in but it's many not like more he's ways. Good shy, you know? right? Exactly. I mean, no, fired it was more like. But that's exactly why it's like you know you're hot. Just just take the shot. But uh. nevertheless, it Deuce didn't have to replace Grimes, right? Like the defensive level, I'd still take Grimes from a point of attack perspective. But you're looking at what Deuce is able to do off the ball, but also kind of the um, the creation there too. Like it always felt like with Grimes, it was, well, this front, this team has stifled his ability to be um, more of a creator that he's really relegated to a quarter specialist, yeah. um, low usage guy. And with Deuce, it's just like, well, he's getting the same opportunities, but he's making more of them yes. or more with them. And I think it's a testament to him and how hard he worked for me. The way that I saw it was I would look at it for most second round picks is I will believe it when I see it because I don't want to 
put all my eggs in the basket mm-hmm. of young players. It's why I also am shy when it comes to the draft. There's a lot that I don't see that it, a lot that is also the temperament of a player that you can't measure. It's really difficult to do that. So seeing Deuce come alive in this way, I'll believe it when I see it. I see it. I believe it. He's not going to consistently keep playing 45, 46, 47, maybe even 48 minutes in a game. I mean, but he can absolutely add enough in the playoffs. And, you know, I, I last season was furious at that game six lineup in the second quarter where yeah. Deuce was playing and Tibbs made a poor choice. It was objectively a poor choice. And the Knicks, I wouldn't say they lost the series because of it, but in a game uh, where the margins are this small, you really need to have your best players on the floor. And I have been feeling, well, as crappy as that situation was, and maybe there was a way to prevent it. Could that also be a learning experience for Deuce for this upcoming playoffs where he learns and can actually benefit the Knicks more when they are a better team, when they have more talent that complements their best players who, especially in Brunson's case, because Randall, of course, was on track to be all NBA and now it's not happening, took that leap that the front office thought he was capable of doing. So just getting like if you were to replace and it's all arbitrary, but that deuce that we saw yeah, with this yeah. one I don't have any qualms whatsoever in fact I'm excited to see him get on the floor so that's precisely where I'm at with deuce I'm not worried I don't think he will replicate a lot of what he's doing from a scoring impact but it just takes one game of him going four or five from three and we're like this is the deuce McBride game and that's how it lives forever and it wouldn't shock me in the slightest if that were to happen I mean you know I'm I'm stealing Andrew's uh, game ball nomination uh, stat, but he, he's shooting 50% on threes over his last three games on high volume. Like th- that is not going to continue. I'm so happy you brought up the heat game because I, it, it, it makes me think like maybe we've been asking the wrong questions about Deuce. And when I say we, I mean me, because I'm constantly thinking along the lines of like, can he spearhead a a a second unit offense where Jalen Brunson is not on the floor? And then you take a step back and you look at around the NBA and you look at what championship teams have and you're like, you look at fucking Denver. Jamal Murray might be one of the 20 best players in the league and he has trouble spearheading a second unit offense without their star on the floor. That should not be the standard the standard should be can deuce be a a a play the the quote unquote point guard position in a in a backup unit um with other real talented guys around him but that doesn't have maybe the best player on the floor and and benji had a great tweet that he sent out um I think it was for the Nets game where he talked, he showed two different um, situations, two different uh, coverages that the Nets gave Deuce uh, when he was above the three point arc, arc. One where they went over the screen, one where they went under the screen, and Deuce just made the, the correct read both times. And like, it's little things like that that make me think, like, yeah, he he's going to be fine. And then when you throw in his ability to uh, do what Emmanuel quickly did. And to play alongside Jalen Brunson and amplify Brunson with his spacing and obviously with his defense on the other end, you just get to a really, really excited um, place with him. And then the last thing I'll just say, again, I'm stepping on your territory here. It's, I don't know if it was intended, but it's nice to see the front office and the coaching staff work, like being simpatico here, where you had, okay, Emmanuel quickly is going to cost us 20, I don't know. Three, four, five million dollars a year. Quinn Grimes, you know, a bit, a bit short for a wing, but he's still like your typical three and D wing. He's going to cost us 12, 13, 14, whatever. But even if it's like mid level money, somewhere around there, we could get this guy for four million dollars a year, 4.3 to be exact. And the coach fucking loves him. And he does all the things that the coach wants out of this position, out of that spot. He, lo- he embraces his role. And it's just, it's kind. It feels like it's starting to be a match made in heaven. I'm not saying he's he's better than quickly. I'm not even saying he's better than Grimes. He's, but it, it seems like it really worked out for the best here. It did. And if we're going to talk about the contract, we're going to talk about the amount that he received. We're going to talk about the scale in terms of how 
yeah. is being paid, which is a descending deal. I mean, we, we will eventually need to talk about the timing of the, the contract well, being signed, yeah. uh, which of course opens them up to at least being available for trade and uh, once free agency begins in the new league year. But yes, just looking at it right now, even if he stays through the duration of that contract, if he were to hit the open market this season, if you told me he'll earn $10 million a year, sure. it, it wouldn't shock me at all because there are teams that have cap space and teams that have need and restricted free agency, the way that it plays out often stifles a player's value, but it just takes one team that says we have, we just have a lot of money to spend and um, we might as well, right? Let's, let's make it worthwhile for us and maybe we pry him loose. And that is just not an option anymore because the Knicks took him squarely off the table. Deuce is leaving the fate of his future employer in the Knicks hands, but he gets to walk away with $13 million. Do I think he's kicking himself that he didn't I, wait? No, I, I, I don't. That, I think he's, I, I mean, thinking about that earlier today, but he's still making $13 million and it will, as long as he keeps playing well, it will set and him he's young. on course. And he's young to yeah. when he's a free agent, an unrestricted free agent, um, three seasons after, you know, whenever the contract's over, yeah. that's where he can make more money. And especially as the salary cap continues to go up. So I'm not too worried about him. I'm happy for him overall, but it's just, uh, it's great to see someone picking up the slack as someone like Alec Burks makes you want to punch a wall or Boyan Bogdanovich makes you question why you love this sport. It's just, uh, then there's Deuce and thank God for Deucey. Hold on, we're not we're not to our detention segment just yet, uh, which will be populated this week. Okay, uh, let's move on. Good, good transition uh, from Deuce to Game Ball. Uh, so Game Ball given to a player, coach, or entity that stood out this week and deserves special recognition. Um, first candidate here again. I, I'm ju- I just read the words on the page uh, from Mr. Andrew Claudio. Deuce of Pride, sixty six points, fifty eight, fifty ninety splits. As I said earlier, hit half his threes in 139 minutes across three starts this week, two of which he played 47 and 48 minutes. I looked it up um, before. Since February 8th, Deuce has the most games in the league in which uh, he has played at least 44 minutes. He's played six games where he's totaled at least 44 minutes. Sure enough, Josh Hart, second on that list. <laughs> Five such games. Um, I'll read Josh Hart's uh, game ball entry now. Josh Hart, triple-double versus the Warriors in 48 minutes. Um, led the Knicks in rebounds uh, this week. Tied with him, uh, Isaiah Hartenstein. Uh, Hart and McBride, by the way, the only two players in the league this year to play 48 minutes in uh, a regulation game and did it for the Knicks. Uh, Hardenstein, 22 of 27 from the field, 27 rebounds, seven steals, five blocks, a plus 24 in 78 minutes this week. Um, I'll, I'll have more on him in a bit. Uh, last two entries, Dante DiVincenzo, uh, 31 points, 13 massive points in the fourth quarter to break the KFS curse against the Nets. And because this is his section, Jalen Brunson. Um, it's saying something that 26 and eight over three games felt disappointing. <laughs> I don't know about disappointing. I think he was, you know, he had a rough week. But, relatively uh, speaking, though, is what Relatively speaking. Yeah. Uh, ben Stiller uh, actually had, a, I think, a tweet to or retweeted someone to this effect. It was like, it's nice when our our point guards bad game. He has like 17 points in the third quarter. Um, I'm going to give this one to Isaiah Hardenstein. And I'm going to give it to Isaiah Hardenstein, put aside all the numbers, um, put aside the fact that he has become vitally important on the offensive end to this team uh, over the last three games in particular, uh, 50 points over the last three. Uh, Hitting, I mean, these little baby, the the baby hook is back, right? The baby hook is back. Uh, He is... He is so instrumental to what they do on the defensive end. And like we, we, we mostly knew that last season. We mostly knew that earlier this season. We I probably realized it in January. I think it wasn't until he started dealing with the Achilles stuff again this year. And wasn't himself, went out for a bit, and then when he came back, he wasn't himself. Until we, and then you had 
you had what to compare it to, right? You had like, oh my God, is he being outplayed by Jericho Sims in this game? Like, that's not some something that anybody should ever say. And yet we could say it. Um, and now we're back. We are so back. And he is back to being the version of himself that he um, can be on the defensive end. And the offensive stuff feels like, I would say it feels like icing on the cake, but it's, again, it's necessary. I don't know where they'd be without um, the offensive hub that he provides. I'm just so thankful to have this dude on the team. Um, he is someone that I unequivocally want to be a Nick for a very, very long time. And I know we're, we're getting out of ourselves to talk about that. A lot, lot, lot will have to happen before we have to figure out that the contract, the next contract situation with him. But I uh, wanted to give him his due here. So Isaiah Arnstein gets my uh, game ball. He's been phenomenal. Uh, Mensa pointed this out about how Brunson and Hartenstein are top two in EPM for the Knicks. But also, how wild is it that the Knicks top two EPM performers are, uh, or they were both free agent signings? And also that they were both free agent signings in the same year, the I same know. summer. That was what an incredible summer that was for this Knicks front office. Yeah. And then when you look at the top four or five EPM players for the Knicks, um, also free agents uh, signings, right? Like yeah. OG was the only one in the trade. Randall, free agent signing. DiVincenzo, MLE. Hartenstein's a great pick. And uh, he's... Just been so like a healthy Hartenstein. The difference between that and and what the unhealthy look, especially oh. last year at the beginning of the season, when he was with that when he was dealing with the Achilles injury, and there was the concern of is this the guy that Nick's paid? Was, no, no, he's just not healthy. And then you see him be healthy and continue to blossom, especially as Brunson gets better, which helps him. They, I mean, they feed off of each other. It's great to see. So that's an excellent pick. I. I'll go with Deuce, but because we talked about Deuce, I'll actually pick another player. And okay. this is going to be an unorthodox pick because it will not be a Nick. But I am actually going to be picking um, on the Nuggets, Reggie Jackson. And I'll tell you why I'm picking <laughs> Reggie Jackson. So last week, after we recorded our podcast, I mentioned that I was going to uh, potentially see the Nuggets and the Mavs play in Dallas. Yes. And I I got to go. Turned out that the clients, you know, Talk to other clients and like, yeah, we were able to get some seats and we got five seats, two close to the court, three in the back. Uh, my boss was towards the back. I got to go towards the front, which was very nice. And I haven't let him forget that. I didn't know where the seats were going to be. I just was informed by Justin, buddy who was taking us on the client side, that we were going to be close. And then we get closer and closer. And then they lead us to our seats and it's, Holy crap, we are sitting on the court and the Nuggets bench is right next to us. And I'll be honest, it was if you watched the game, it was a phenomenal game. Like you couldn't have asked for a more exciting basketball game. And I spent almost all of my time looking the other direction because I was just so enthralled by the dynamics of what happened on the Nuggets bench. Like you hear various things like it's cool to see Mike Malone screaming at Jamal, but he's like, Maul, Maul, Maul. And like, okay, that's like a fun nickname. And it, it just all these fun portions of it. But throughout the game, you know, Reggie Jackson's at the end of the bench and I've got popcorn. And I'm like, Reggie, you want some popcorn? He's like, I'm good. And I asked him a second time. He's like, no, I'm good. I appreciate it. Thank you. And, you know, we have like these fun things back and forth, like a ball don't lie type moment. And, you know, yeah. like, hang on, like two for one, all those little things. It's just fun to go back and forth. And then final possession for the Nuggets. Uh, Jamal Murray takes a shot earlier than I yep. would have uh, thought would be best. And it was like, all right, one stop and overtime, it's fine. And Reggie Jackson had been sitting in his seat the whole time because he clearly is on the um, good luck, bad luck side. Like, this is working for me. I'm superstitious. So for the final possession, he actually stood up and watched with his teammates. And of course, Kyrie uses his left hand to hit an insane floater to win the game. And it was a crazy moment. But in that one moment, Reggie Jackson turns from the court and looks at me because you didn't have to do, did not have to do this. He looked back at me after we had this fun banter back and forth. And we just exchanged this look that's like, what can you do? Right? Like, what are you going to do? And it's just like, in that moment, he he made me a fan for life. Cool dude. I I appreciated him making what was already an incredible game, just all the more of an exciting experience. 
and uh, I'll give him my game ball. That's that's a great call. Great story. Um, also pretty cool that you got to see the shot of the year in the NBA. <laughs> <laughs> it was wild. And I, I, I was cheering for the Nuggets because number one, Obviously. I wanted the pick to be better. Number two, I wasn't going to cheer for the Mavs when I'm right next to the Nuggets. Yeah. Or, like, but yes, that shot, I insane. And I'll, I'll give credit. The Mavs fans, uh, MF, MFFL, they're fantastic. It's a great that's... fan base. It's a good arena. It's a lot of fun to be there. Um, all in all, good day. I don't, I don't have issues with Mavs fans. Um, so that's very cool. Uh, all right. Less well, cool. Uh, here we go. Detention given to a player, coach, or entity that deserves to sit down for a while and think about what they did wrong. Our candidates, Josh Hart, 9 to 31, and 0 for 11 from three this week, two for his last 28 from three. Um, not great. And if you give this to Josh Hart, I will murder you uh, because we have two candidates, both former Pistons. I don't, I mean, I don't know what there is to say. Boyan Bogdanovich almost led the Knicks in turnovers despite playing just 38 minutes this week. That's not ideal. And Alec Burks passed the ball. I, how many exclamation points did Andrew write there? It looks like it's about 28. Um, other candidates, uh, NBA officials, uh, Jalen Brunson took 24 shots on Saturday. Uh, only four were from deep and 15 were in the paint. And sometimes somehow he did not ex- attempt a single free throw. Um, but the NBA officials uh, sucking ass is old news. And then of course, Jaime Hakas Jr. Because this is where he lives perpetually. Uh, Jeremy, it's, it's, it's your pick. Um, I'm curious which way you go. This is tough. Uh, it is not tough. because I think there's a challenging answer because I don't know which piston to take this week. Yeah. Like, I mean, I'll take whichever one you don't. I'll, I'll take. I'll take Burks this time because I'm pretty sure I took okay. Bogdanovich last time. And, you know, he, he turned it on a little bit in that Nuggets game in the fourth quarter towards the end. But yeah. the experience, the end of the third and the beginning of the fourth alone would make him worthy. Like he it's 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 been very clear that this was a band-aid situation short term. He's not going to be the guy that you bring back but he's got to be better than this. Even when it feels like he's on, I just, you know, there's a, a, a thought of who is he going to be? Is he going to be someone who can bail the Knicks out? And instead I can't help, but feel like they are worse off when he's playing. Like he kept hit, he kept shooting threes. He had to hit one of them in that Nets game as well. It felt like, all right, great. You're locked in. Perfect. And that's the beauty of Burks. If Burke, I'm sorry, of uh, Deuce, excuse me. If Deuce weren't this type of player, that's, appearing in front of our very eyes. I'd be terrified of what happens come playoff time when Jalen Brunson is perhaps not on the floor. And now I'm still nervous about that, but it's far less of a concern. But I just, at a certain point, it's like Burks, you can't keep waiting. Um, My hope is that when the Knicks welcome players back, it will eventually phase Burks out of the lineup. But positionally, I don't, fully know if it does I, it really depends on what players are going to be in the lineup because if you have someone else initiating that's not Brunson like if you have Randall playing heavy minutes then maybe you're able to lighten the load in terms of who is initiating on the offensive end but I just I don't I don't see it ending it's one of those things where I feel like you can phase it out a little but it's just it's got to get better and it's seemingly not happening w- We've been saying for uh, uh, whatever it's been six weeks that it has to it has to get better. Um, I mean, I'll take Bogey obviously, but like again, it's it's the same conversation. I'm I'm at here's where I'm at. Is there anything that these guys can do in the next whatever it is week two weeks, rest of the regular season that would give Thibodeau the confidence to play them? more than either of them, more than four or five minutes in the first half of a playoff game. And I am, we're like, I think we're right on the precipice of that answer, just being no. Um, But look, we'll see. Uh, They're playing the Pistons tomorrow, maybe seeing their old team again. (laughs) We'll we'll light a fire. I I have no idea, but uh, it's just... They're they're just they're just not. I mean, they're not good enough, and it's a question of like, 
would you be better off just not playing either at this point with how many bodies they're down? I think I still think like you just to get a few extra minutes, you're, you're better off playing them. But like the, the second someone either, either OG or Randall comes back. And honestly, maybe the second, like, well, no, I guess Mitch coming back wouldn't change anything. Cause then even if you move pressures to the four, then like, you're not going to play like a seven man rotation. So, but we're getting, look, we're getting close. Um, we're getting close to these guys. Like the 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 rope is we're all, we're at a rope. There's no more rope. So that is- can I just add one thing? Because Jeremy was at the game, and I want to know if your experience is, was like ours. So we're at T Squared Social yesterday, and the reason I put in all caps on the rundown pass the ball for Alec Burks. We said when he checked into the game, we were gonna do a drinking game, and anytime he passed the ball out of the half court. We would all take a drink. And we were like, will this be the most sober watch party that we've ever, ever had? Right. End of the third quarter. He gets the ball with about 36 seconds left. And instead of a two for one, he just walks the ball up the court. Sims comes over to set the pick. Dennis Smith Jr. is hounding him. Mm. A, a chorus of pass the balls from everyone watching was like, pass the ball, Alex, pass the ball. And what did he do, Jeremy? What do you think he did? Didn't pass the ball. Pulled a pull up contested three with Dayron Sharp in his face. It is becoming comical. And I challenge anybody watching and in, in uh, watching or listening, just take take a drink. Whatever your favorite beverage is, alcohol, water, coffee, whatever it is. If he ever passes the ball, we're just just take a drink. He did it in, in garbage time at the end, and it led to a heart uh a DiVincenzo layup, which was like, oh wow, that counts, I guess. But it's I don't know if like in the arena, you guys are yelling at him too, like pass the ball. Like, come on, man, pass the ball. Well, do you remember what happened shortly after that? That was the Cam Thomas three, the buzzer beater. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Even better. Cause Even and better. effect. Like, yep. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying that Cam Thomas would have, like, wouldn't have gotten it, whether or not that shot happened, but it changes the calculus and the odds of it happening at the very least. Uh, it, yeah. Just, I, no, not great I, I, I can't talk about Alec Burks anymore. Uh, let's end on a, a happy note, which is uh, predictions, because, man, something's happening here. Um, I have yeah, almost I'll tell you what's happening. Benji blowing my lead. <laughs> Keep blaming it on Benji. I will. Uh, I'm, I'm almost all the way back. Something tells me, I don't know. I don't have a lot of confidence this week because I feel like I'm, I'm on the precipice and now I'm going to. I'm gonna shit the bed. So I have moved to nine and ten. Jeremy is, of course, ten and nine. You're still in. You're still in front. Um, we have four game week. Here are the games. Detroit at home, Monday, Wednesday at Toronto, Friday at San Antonio, and then Sunday back home to face the um uh dangerous Oklahoma City Thunder, who I'm looking up on the TV screen right now, down by losing. Yeah, down by 14 to the uh the Bucks. Um two potential answers here for me. I I know the I know the chalk I know the chalk answer. I think the chalk answer is pretty obvious. Um man. Yeah. Uh, uh I'm wondering if I took the if I took the chalk answer, would you actually would you actually think about doing doing something crazy? No, okay. Um, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna. I'm gonna trust my. No, I don't. I don't. I can't trust my gut. My gut doesn't know what it wants. I'll go two and two. Um, I, I keep saying, like uh, to expect. Uh, John. John. No, no, please, no, no. Take say say what you need to say. Continue. What? No, no. Continue ahead, with, your, with your continue with with your chain, train of thought for Andrew. Uh, interjected. To expect this team to win every game that they're supposed to win, I feel like would be is unfair. And I at some point they're gonna drop a quote unquote bad game. And I like they're running out of bad games. If they don't, I'll be happy to own it. And then there's OKC, who has been the second best team in the league all year long. They have an outstanding net rating. If the Knicks don't have their guys back by that game, and I, I don't think they're going to have their guys back by that game, I just think that that's a tough one to win. So I'm, I'm going to go two and two. Okay. So I'll, I'll take three and one, naturally. Okay. But how would you feel if I told you I was prepared to take four and oh? 
<laughs> I was thinking that you were prepared to take four now, but I don't know. What can I listen? If you if you win the week, then kudos to you. You would have had it anyway if you had taken three and one, and I had taken four and zero. Oh, but uh, this this is a shocker. But I will I will take it, and may may I win because it means the next one. I, I that's my rationale. Is if I lose, I'll be happy because it means the Knicks have gone three and one. And if the Knicks go three and one this week, I will be ecstatic. See, I, I don't buy it. I don't buy it because if you had picked three and one and I had picked four and oh, then you could have used that rationale. I did. But I wasn't now, sure. I wasn't sure you were going to pick four and oh. I thought you might. I was not sure you were going to do it. I, I, if I had to bet, I would have bet that you would have taken two and two. Okay. All right. Well, now the Knicks got to just win three games, preferably four. I think that'd needless be great. to say, I hope I lose. That goes without saying. Can I just say from a strategic standpoint, standpoint, which is my reaction, if you go three and one, you then force his hand to either be perfect this week or go into Sunday night rooting for a loss I know. because it's two and two. Which like sometimes you could throw a slant at the one yard line or you could just hand the ball off to Marshawn Lynch. I look, I get it. I get it. I probably outthought myself. I. What do you want me to do? Valiant comeback. I listen. I hope. I hope you lose. Is all I'm going to say. We all, we all, I hope all you in lose. agreement. Yes. We all hope I lose. Okay. But we, we all I hope just, Tom loses. This is predictions, not like I, I don't know what, what the other the alternative would be. Um. Not not predictions. Yeah. I I I don't know. It's it, look. It's going to be. I think it's a. These are. These are dicey. Every every game is dicey. Every game is dicey. Here, here's my counter, though. I, I'll just say this. The reason I was prepared to go 4-0 is I look at this Knicks team, and they have won five of their last six. Yes. Uh, and what? Uh, seven of their last... What is this? One, two, three, four, five, six of their last eight. Yeah. Um, I, With the I, best defense in, in the league over that stretch. And look, it, it just takes a trap, t- trap game. I thought that Saturday's game was a trap game and through three quarters it had the makings of one it, it, and then it. they just took off in the fourth so to your point look the Pistons are still a feisty team even if they're missing players um, the Raptors you know I don't know who's playing candidly as there some tragedies that have befallen uh, yes. both RJ Barrett and Emmanuel quickly and think of, of we're talking about RJ last week of course think of Emmanuel quickly and his family this week yes I don't know who's going to appear on the court the Spurs, Wemby is transcendent. And he is just an incredible basketball player. It takes one game of him going off and the Knicks, I mean, just not being able to hold up for that to be a loss. And then the Thunder, who my hope, of course, is that because they are uh, just an egregious rebounding team, that yeah. that's the game that you have Mitch back and you bully them on the boards. This is a team that lost to the Thunder by nine points right before everything happened with the trade. Yeah. So brand new team, who's going to be there in comparison? You've got an away game. How are you going to manage it? I don't really know. But uh, yeah, I, I, I get where you're coming from in terms of the apprehension. I just feel good about how this team has been the last few weeks. I, last week I, and a half. I feel really good about where they are too. It's just like to, the, the thought that it's going to be smooth sailing. And, and again, they could go three and one this week or four and oh for that matter. And it still might not be smooth sailing because again, the magic are coming and like the, maybe the Cavs get down on Mitchell back and like whatever else. And they have a tough schedule down the stretch. They have a really tough schedule down the stretch, but I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll see. Is Wemby the thing that scared you? I think it's a couple things. It's Wemby. Wemby does scare me. The Spurs at home were going into San Antonio scares me a little bit. The fact that since I forget what it is, at least the all-star break. And I think maybe even more than that, the Spurs are outscoring teams when Wemby's on the floor. That scares me. The fact that the Spurs are a very long team scare me because long teams typically have given the Knicks uh, fits this season defensively. And the only other thing, and, uh, and maybe it's just recency bias with the Saturday game uh, for Jalen Brunson. I wonder if Brunson doesn't need to catch his breath a little bit. And I wonder if he's maybe because because here's the thing they survived the bad Brunson game, but like 
they survived it against the Nets. And and with all due respect to the Nets, who the fuck am I kidding? I have no respect for the Nets. Um, the Nets are ass, and they're yet again one of their players called out their own effort. How many t- how many times in the same season could a player call out the team or the coach call out the team's effort and like multiple coaches, multiple coach exactly because they fired the last one because it happened too often. So I I don't know. Um, okay, listen, I'll I'll quote the, you you quoted uh what movie was it at the beginning? Um oh uh Deer Hunter Major uh, that and Major League got a quote. I'll quote Dumb and Dumber. Just when I thought you couldn't say some be any stupider or say something any stupider, you say this and totally redeem yourself. We don't need to show the Nets any respect. I love it. All right. So I'm going to take over for announcements real quick because yes. um, we just have two and well, three because we're recording after Easter. So to everybody celebrating next weekend, happy Easter. Um, so the first one, shout out to everybody that came to T-Squared Social. This is our crew for those watching on YouTube. John and one of his lovely daughters, the whole Macri family made it out. Uh, apologies for the lighting, fellas. Um, that's just the lighting at T-Squared Social at the moment. Uh, shout out to Sean and Mensa, as well as Zach with an H who came through. Uh, also, if you're just watching, that's how spacious T-Squared Social is. So that that exists in New York City. You should come through the next time we have one of these watch parties. And then in case you missed it, Jeremy, I don't know if you caught this or not, but we hit 15K on YouTube. And just shout out to everybody that subscribes uh, and watches, uh, getting to hear from people um, that it partake in our content and contribute to our content in ways. Uh, it's just really cool. And um, thank you for your support. And here's to 15,000 more. Giddy up. I like it. Um, 15,000. That's a, that's a nice number. Uh, help us keep growing. Uh, subscribe. If you're watching right now, do the whole thing. Uh, Andrew, anything else before we go? Nope. That was it. Jeremy? All set. Looking forward to three and one or better. So am I. Uh, I think they're going four and oh, but that's just me. Man, if they go four and oh this week. I'm projecting some injury good news too. Okay. So. I- Listen, I hope you're right. Um, everybody, thank you as always. Hope you enjoyed the episode. We will be back with uh, more funny games in the week ahead. Pre-games, post-games, the whole thing. Uh, reminder to our uh, Monroe tier patrons and up. We got Town Hall coming up this week, so looking forward to that. Um, hopefully be riding uh, what I guess it would be six wins and seven games uh, hopefully at the time we record that. And uh, yeah, thanks everybody for listening to another episode and uh, we'll be back uh, very soon. Peace out.